Uh, our next session is Overview of Multicopter Control from Sensors to Motors by Matthew Briscani and Matthias Brob. They're coming from uh, Zurich, Switzerland. Matthew and Matthias are both flight control engineers out of Therian and are PX4 maintainers. In this session, they will give an overview of the components within PX4 to control multicopter vehicles from sensor input pipeline overestimation through cascaded position, attitude, rate control, and the output allocation, and also zoom in on certain selected aspects and answer additional related questions regarding navigation, controls, and com development. All right, so let's hear it from Mathieu and Matthias. Welcome to a new talk about navi in the navigation control series. Uh, I'll present today with Matthias uh, the, the overview of multicopter control from sensor to motors. So I'll first let Matthias introduce himself. Hi, I'm, I'm Matthias Krob, I'm Matt Tucker on GitHub. I work with PX4 for a lot of years now. I joined the maintenance and uh, developer team in 2017 and I'm flight control engineer at Otarian. So my name is Mathieu uh, Bresciani. Uh, my name, my GitHub nickname is Bresh. I'm maintainer since 2018. I work for three years with PX4 and my main focus is uh, estimation and multicopter control. So we'll first give you an overview of the multicopter pipeline then specifically on the IMU side of that pipeline, um, different paths on estimation and control. Then Matthias will give you an overview, um, an update on flight task from last year, and then explain the quaternion alt attitude control. And I finally uh, talk about um, control location. So like the title says, we want to give you a quick overview over the components in PX4 that make up everything that's necessary to fly a multicopter. Uh, this overview is, is very rough and there is not an arrow for each and every uh, data path, but the general path is there. So from, from left to right, uh, we have the feedback loop here. Um, here closed and from the top comes the data path that determines the behavior of the vehicle. So on the left, we start with sensor drivers that get in our raw data from an example of uh, sensors. For every component, I wrote down the path as well in the code, if you want to look it up uh, such that you'll easily find it. And I wrote down the topics that are published over uh, UORP where the data is then given over to the next module. Each sensor um, publishes his specific data on a specific topic, and this then gets further processed in the sensor hub that we'll cover later on a bit more. Then it goes through uh, an EKF, the estimator, uh, which is covered by Paul Riceborough tomorrow. Um, then from the top comes, as I said, the behavioral uh, path of data. So your input comes through here, what mode you're in, how you want to fly and what your um, stick input is from the remote. And this goes then into the position control, attitude control and rate control uh, pipeline for multicopter that was covered by Anton uh, just before. And we will cover some, like we said, some of the flight task updates and attitude control in this talk. Uh, then it goes through the mixer to determine what motor needs to do what. And uh, there's also a further talk about control allocation uh, later on in the Dev Summit. So first part, what uh, I would like to talk is the IMU pipeline. So I would like to emphasize that there are two different paths. There is the, the top one, which will go for the estimation. So we have that path that is low rate and unfiltered that goes directly to the EKF2 other, uh, after going, coming from the IMU driver. And that is the low one, which is a high rate and filtered um, signal that goes to the rate controller. So first we have the driver directly reading the data from the, from the IMU. That one is usually triggered by uh, an interrupt. 
And then you have processed the accelerometer on the top here and the, and the gyro on the bottom, quite similarly, uh, except that on the, the accelerometer side, you have a clip counter that then is used by the EKF to try to, um, to counteract some effect of clipping. And then there is uh, the, uh, the rotation to, to put everything in the, in the correct frame from the, the defined um, autopilot. Then it gets uh, integrated to, uh, to have the, the defined rate of here 800 hertz, which can be also uh, selected by this parameter that controls the, mainly the, the gyro rate frequency. So it can be changed for 400 to 4 kilohertz. Um, not that on, you need a, um, um, a quite new generation of board to run the control at 4 kilohertz as it consumes quite a lot of resources. Uh, default is 800 hertz. And uh, you can log directly here the FIFO data at uh, 4 kilohertz if you have a good SD card by enabling the, the logging on, with that parameter. And then you can directly plot uh, those um, spectrogram and fast Fourier transform of the accelerometer and the gyro uh, using the, the that website, uh, which is flight review, and so you can analyze the vibration uh, of your drone quite uh, quite well. Sorry for that. So. Um, then the estimation path, which was on the top of the, the, um, the slide before, um, you can select the, the IMU integ integration rate that will define the output rate of the EKF, which is the attitude message, uh, but not the, um, the, the other one, which is position and uh, velocity, and the other, other message, which are fixed at uh, 100 hertz. So there are two, for, for each IMU, you have one of those blocks, which is vehicle IMU, that receive calibration, compute some vibration metrics, and are published to the vehicle IMU topic. That vehicle IMU topic, so as I said, there is one per IMU, and that will enable us uh, in the future to, to run one EKF per IMU, and then switch over. Uh, right now, we're still using that topic that you may have heard of, which is called center combine. It's actually one instance of that vehicle IMU topic with the highest priority. So soon we'll have multi EKF, we already have prototype working and that will enable switching between um, IMUs depending on the, on, the state, on the state of the estimator. Then on the control path, which is uh, faster, we have um, uh, first part, the acceleration. So it got also calibrated, compensated for the estimated bias of the, of the estimator. And then there is a low pass filter that you can select, which is uh, that, that one, I'm your Excel cutoff. And that goes into the vehicle acceleration topics. It's not a lot used in multi-copter, but it's more used on fixed wing and also on uh, in commander for uh, launch detection and uh, load uh, factor um, uh, computations. Here on, on the bottom part, you have the, the gyroscope, the data that comes in, gets calibrated also, compensated for bias from the estimator. And the difference with the accelerometer is that you can select here a notch filter and then the, um, the low pass filter. Also in that same block, it computes the derivative and filters it that will go to the, the rate control directly. And on the right side, you see all the, the parameters that can control the different kind of filters. And on the bottom here, like that specific notch filter, where you can select the notch frequency and the bandwidth of the, of the filter. So since I'm uh, one of the authors of Flight Task and I gave a speak already on the last, last year's Dev Summit, I wanted to give a quick update on the to-dos we had from last year, what was done in that year. Uh, one of the to-dos was to avoid discontinuities between mode switches or also then task switches, uh, which were present because an, the new task didn't know what the old task was doing before and uh, only had the current vehicle state to take over, which is not enough because uh, it cannot know how to continue with the set point uh, in a continuous way. 
And the idea here to solve that is to just capture the last set point that was executed from the task before. And that gets passed onto the activate function of the new task. And then it's his responsibility to take over continuously. A second bigger change that uh, is now uh, made possible is the execution of acceleration set points. And I have the next two slides to explain this in more depth to you. So like presented last year, the main interface between flight task and position control was uh, position, velocity, and thrust. And now new, the thrust, the unit thrust 3D vector is replaced with acceleration in actual meters per second square. This is done because the unit thrust was uh, more dependent on the vehicle mass and maximum thrust. And so you can now set in your flight task um, uh, any, any set point combination of position, velocity, acceleration, yaw and yaw speed, uh, use, but uh, only adhering to the two requirements I wrote here. Every dimension needs to have at least one set point, otherwise it doesn't know what to do. And the horizontal set point in X and Y needs to come in pairs, so you cannot exclusively have position set point for X and uh, velocity set point for Y, for example. Um, as an implication of that, the output of the velocity controller is now not thrust, but acceleration. And to have that represented in the gain, um, we rescaled the gain from and, and renamed the parameter with that, that uh, underscore X at the end. And to show you how to convert to that new gain scaling, uh, the default gains were rescaled by this factor of uh, the gravity acceleration over hover thrust, uh, which is uh, ap approximately 10 meters per second squared over uh, an assumed 15, uh, 50 percent hover thrust, which is about 20, factor of 20. So if you rescale your gains, uh, you will have uh, acceptable results and from there on it should be more consistent independent of the vehicle weight. Additionally, I want to show you that the strategy of the attitude set point generation changed. Before um, the 3D thrust vector was directly used to uh, generate the attitude and that had some problems because the vertical um, vehicle dynamics are usually much faster than the horizontal or rotational ones in practice. And so the idea to solve this is to make the tilt of the vehicle, so uh, the tilt of the attitude independent of the vertical demanded acceleration. I have here a, a small example on the right side. Uh, we demand a horizontal acceleration of four meters per second squared, and that directly de uh, determines the tilt of, of the demanded thrust um, by, by projecting with assuming uh, uh, the gravitational acceleration in the vertical direction. And the demanded acceleration in the vertical direction then can only change the amount of collective thrust, but the tilt stays the same independent of uh, the vertical control. Um, yeah. Um, further, I want to address some to-dos that are still remaining uh, related to flight tasks. Uh, flight tasks are now a library instantiated in position control and should be moved out into their separate component. Uh, there is still an inheritance structure which is kind of hard to get into and um, yeah, it, it, it hinders the sequential reading of what, what is ex executed. Then uh, flight tasks are planned to be extended to flight modes, which support also other set points like rate and attitude set points directly. This would then cover all, all possible flight modes and uh, we have no exceptions left for modes that cannot be covered. Then a goal is to import the existing navigation states for autonomous flight like takeoff, RTL land into such flight modes 
such that we have one uh, single type for for a, to represent the mode and not like scattered over over the code. Uh, then there's also a low barrier with those flight modes to also be used for other vehicle types like uh, fixed wing VTOL or rover. And also a, a further goal is to hook it up with the state machine, which is now commander to, um, to be able to infer the state mach machine transitions from certain prop properties of the mode directly. Now I want to go further down the pipeline to the attitude control. Uh, I want to explain hopefully um, in, a, in an easy way how we calculate and, and act on an error in attitude. So in green on the right side, we see our desired uh, attitude set point uh, represented now here as a completely level attitude with these uh, three unit vectors. Then we know from the estimator in red that we are currently tilted to the side. And so we need to roll back. Um, in quaternion arithmetic, a multiplication is a rotation of a quaternion. So we are looking for the error that rotates us from the current estimate to where we want to be, the set point. Um, that quaternion error we find by rearranging the uh, equation. Then after we calculated this quaternion error, we take a closer look at the individual four components. The first component, which is the first line uh, here, we are not interested in, uh, in, in this calculation. So we look at the other three components that are at the bottom and they represent a 3D vector which points into the direction of the um, rotation axis around which we need to rotate. It's the blue vector here in the graph. And this vector is scaled by sine of the tilt angle divided by two. I quickly plotted here sine over uh, sine of alpha divided by two. And we can see between minus 180 degrees and 180 degrees, it's monoton monotonically uh, increasing, which means the more tilt angle we have, the more error uh, we, we infer and the more uh, action we give as a rate set point. And so we take these three components at the bottom to use as our um, rate set point, of course, scaled by the proportional gain of the controller. I didn't invent this uh, algorithm. It's uh, represented uh, more in detail in that paper that is also referenced in the code. So I'll quickly discuss about control location. So basically what's control location is, is a way to transform the desired force and torques that come out of the rate controller into the actuator outputs. So it's kind of mysterious blocks here that has to do that operation. Uh, fortunately, we can use linear algebra to achieve that as the system will, is close to linear if we only use force and torques. And how do we compute that control location matrix? So, what we do is that we take the, the geometry of the vehicle and uh, the force that can produce each motor. Uh, given that, we can build the actuator effectiveness matrix here. And then by computing the inverse, we can have the control location matrix. That inverse is, if it's squared, it's just a, a squared matrix, it's just a normal inverse. And if not, if you have more actuators than uh, and inputs, then you can have a, have a pseudo inverse here computed by a more Penrose um, solution. So basically how to add new geometry. So you have a new vehicle that has a crazy shape with uh, 20 motors or I don't know how many. Uh, you want to add a new file for that to have a new mixer. You can have the description, you can have your own description in uh, in a new file in that path. It's a TOML file. You, you can describe the position and the force of each uh, actuator. You create a, a new key for it, a unique key. And then in the, the ROM FS, you can create a new mixer with that line, which means that the R is for a multi-copter. Here is your key. 
And uh, those numbers are just for legacy reasons. You don't need to worry about it. And then simply call that, that mixer, that you, uh, you, your new mixer into your config. And at build time, it will compile everything for you. We have a Python script that will generate directly that uh, control location matrix based on the geometry, generate the, the C, um, C file, and it's ready to go. Also, that's why it's super fast to run in air because you don't need to recompute every time. Uh, one option that you can enable in, uh, in control location is called air mode. So air mode is the, is the way to increase the, um, the authority of some axis over the, the thrust. So for example, here on, on that graph, you see on the X axis, that's the, the roll torque you, you're demanding on, uh, with that small uh, arrow here. And on the vertical axis is the collective thrust. So for a normal quad, it looks like that shape. So you have the maximum uh, authority when you're at 50%, because that's when you have the maximum differential thrust that you can apply. So if you have no air mode and you can attain the desired torque uh, and thrust, it will just allocate it. If you have air mode, it's the same. Here, if it's unattainable and you have no air mode and uh, the roll torque is not feasible, then it will constrain it to the what's, what's actually feasible and not touch the thrust. If you enable air mode, what you can have is that it will give you a boost of collective thrust to be able to allocate the full uh, torque. Uh, one thing to, so a few things to mention here, so you can activate it by, uh, by setting that MC air mode parameter. You have different modes, so a roll pitch only prioritization of a thrust or roll pitch yo. Um, you will only uh, activate normally roll pitch yo on, on a racer or on drones that have strong yo authority. And it works much better if you have kind of a linear mapping between uh, between the output that goes to the motor and the actual thrust, because we assume it's a linear system. So try to linearize the, um, that mapping using that model factor here. And also be sure that you first tune your vehicle before you activate air mode, because otherwise you can have a bad thing happening. Uh, let's imagine you have the, here the x-axis that oscillate. If you have air mode active, it will always put your thrust uh, at the midpoint. So You'll, you might fly away because of that. And thank you for your attention. Now we'll answer a few questions. So yeah, I'll directly take the, the first one. Uh, what is accelerometer clipping? So basically uh, clipping or asymmetric railing is a problem that you have on the Z axis. So on the vertical axis of the accelerometer because of the gravity offset. So the problem when you start to have uh, high vibration uh, you have um, clipping on both sides, and uh, the actual average value we'll have will be zero instead of one G. So that will fool usually the na navigation um, inertial solution of the estimator, and as a result, uh, the, um, the vehicle will fly in the sky usually. So we implement something to to detect that clipping, and then to um, to constrain the estimator not to, to drift because of that. Um, so I take the next question. The question is, are acceleration set points available in the last stable version of uh, version 1.10.1? And the answer is yes, it's available for the interface of the flight task. At the moment, I think there is no flight task directly using it for um, other things than feed forward. So the current mission and also uh, stick mapped flight task for position mode use it as feed forward and it's used for uh, certain specific things like VTOL transition, but there is nothing that takes advantage of the exclusive uh, acceleration set point. But uh, that can be added at any time and will be added. Um, the next question I take as well, is there an up-to-date tutorial or summary that covers everything to create a new flight task? If not, can we expect uh, one sometimes? And um, I can say it's, it's a bit of my fault because uh, in the dev guide, you will not find the content of last, uh, of 
last year's Fly Task talk, except for the video of the last talk. Uh, and I will still add the content, of, so the graphs and the description, yes. And I, we will also add the content of this talk uh, such that you're able to uh, look this up later on. Like the video will be available, but also in the dev guide. So the next question is, will the plan for flight task structure improvement be implemented in version 1.11 stable version? Um, I would say that depends on what improvement. Like I named a lot of improvements, uh, six, six possible ones. And I think the first three ones were lower hanging fruits that will be done a lot earlier and can probably be expected for a next uh, stable release. But I cannot promise anything. And the, the ones on the bottom are uh, more in-depth and will probably take a bit more time. 